Dr. Krupner definitely is a pioneer in the study of consciousness and has conducted research for over 50 years or more in dreams and hypnosis and shamanism, disassociation. And the thing that is really impressive when I hear him talk is that he gives such a cross-cultural perspective on all of these things. He's had an appointment faculty appointments at so many universities. I I couldn't even believe the list that he's been involved in educating um, people in the field of psychology throughout North and South America. Stanley has written many books and um, over 1,200 scholarly articles, uh, chapters, papers, publications. He He's incredible on what he can produce at the same time, having time for people um, like us today to share with them. And so it is with very deep appreciation that I introduce all of you to Dr. Stanley Krupner. Thank you, Stan. Oh, thank you, Justina. Thank you. So we're going to take a trip Back in the time, talk about shamans. They were first scientific investigators and the first spiritual practitioners. And they popped up in various parts of the world, indicating that they are really serving important functions for society. And if they didn't, they would never have appeared so often in so many cultures. So here's a definition of shamanism that I use. Shamans are socially sanctioned practitioners who voluntarily regulate their attention to access information not ordinarily available, using it to facilitate healthy development and alleviate stress and illnesses among members of their community and their community as a whole. So let's just pause and take a look at the definition because I tried to put it in very, very simple terms rather than more esoteric terms. First of all, they're socially sanctioned practitioners. In other words, It's the society that decides who their shamans are. And in some societies, if the shaman is no longer serving a useful purpose, they're sent into exile. So it is the community This is the very, very basis of the shaman's work. So, they voluntarily regulate their attention. In other words, they alter their consciousness. And they do this in a number of ways. Many of which start with the letter D. Dancing and drugs and dreams, etc. So, They get this information from what they call the spirit world or from nature spirits or from discarnate entities. But they get this information in a way that other members of their tribe really don't know how to do. What type of information do they get? Well, information about which herbs can serve a medicinal purpose or what needs to be done to uh, put a family together that has become angry at each other. Or 
protecting the tribe against enemies of one sort or another. So these are all very positive functions that the shamans serve for their community. You hear a lot about call. The call is the way in which the practitioner elects to fulfill a spiritual vocation or a spiritual path. Now, the call to shamanize occurs somewhat different in different societies. But these are some of the possibilities. Sometimes the shaman becomes seriously ill and interprets this as a call to shamanize. Once they are learning how to cure themselves, then they go on to learn how to cure and heal other people. So this is one way. But there's another way. The hereditary call. Sometimes it sort of runs in families to shamanize. Now they still have to have the permission from their society, but they can gain this permission by following in the footsteps of their predecessors and come up with remarkable healings, remarkable predictions, or the like. The third way that the call occurs is in some profound personal experience, like a very, very vivid dream, uh, a vision of some sort, a conversation with a spirit, while taking ayahuasca, for example. So all of those are the three basic ways in which somebody is responding to the call. Now, the shaman is usually trained by an older shaman, but sometimes they claim to be trained by spirits, often in their dreams, and they get lessons in their dreams and how to shamanize. And these are some of the themes in their training. Death and rebirth. This is something, of course, that requires special attention, special training, something that members of the society or the tribe uh, simply are not equipped to do. Assisting transitions. This is what they call the psychopomp. Uh, transitions in birth, for example, in death, coming of age, all of these are transitions that can be ritualized by shamans. Also, care of the soul. If the soul is lost, then they have to retrieve the soul. They also deal with messages from the afterlife, Many of them are able to identify past lives of their clients. Here we have a whole bevy of themes the shaman is trained to do. And of course, I also mentioned the herbal knowledge, the uh, knowledge of medicinal herbs that's passed on from one shaman to another. Well, here we have the various Ds that I mentioned. And they can alter their consciousness through drumming, through dancing, through dreaming, drugs, diet, deprivation. In other words, a great going on a fast. All of these are vehicles for them to enter the spirit world and get this non-ordinary knowledge. There are so-called shamanic states of consciousness, and in these states of consciousness, the shamans get this unusual, extraordinary knowledge. And dreams and visions, of course, intuitions and feeling, observations of the natural world, and observation of the social world. 
the shamans are trained to be very, very acute observers and listeners so they don't miss anything about what is going on from the nature spirits, for example, and from the interactions of members of the tribe. So these are all highly developed skills. Shamanic myth-making and storytelling utilize symbols, metaphors, and narratives. And it was these wonderful stories that the shamans told that became part of the folklore of their particular tribe or society. So the storytelling function of shamanism is something that is very, very key to the survival of the society. Symbols and metaphors help shamans make sense of their own internal processes, what's going on in their own body or spiritual growth, their natural environment, the non-human intelligence from animals and trees and waves and all of the forces of nature, also their interactions with other people. They can use a symbol or metaphor during healing. They can talk, for example, about body cleansing or spiritual cleansing. And the cleansing, of course, is a metaphor for a person getting well. They also will talk about internal alchemy, using different words, of course, the way that they can change themselves through proper spiritual practices and diet and meditations. They also interactions with the spirit world. This is how the shamans, for example, gave names to the constellations in the heavens. And of course, different parts of the world identified different configurations. So it was not exactly a uniform metaphor, but it very rarely is when you get to shamanism. Also, their interaction with the spirit world talk with animal spirits, for example, their power animals, their totems, and also the spirit of the herbs that they use for healing. From a psychological perspective, myths are statements or stories that address existential human concerns that have behavioral consequences. They explain natural phenomena. They guide people through life transitions. They align, assign people their place in society, and they connect people with spiritual realms. So you can see that myth and shamanism go hand in hand. It's the shamans who create the myths in the first place, and then the myths create the shamanic functions. Myths are often enacted in community bonding activities, rites, rituals, and ceremonies. Basically, the rite is very short. The ritual is longer. The ceremony is the longest yet. That's one way I differentiate those terms. These mythic performances reinforce belief systems, moral codes, and social and personal identities. And of course, over the years, I've seen a great many mythic performances. Most notably, a few years ago, I was in Western Ontario, Canada, and I was invited to a potlatch, P-O-T-L-A-T-C-H, a potlatch, a term used for a big festival in which things are given away to the participants. And in this case, there was a tribal chief who had died many months earlier, but it took all that amount of time for them to gather the gifts that they would give away to the people who attended. So the potlatch lasted an entire week, 
I was able to stay for three days of the potlatch, and it was in a newly constructed arena that the Canadian government had set up for First Nation people to perform their functions. What gift did we get? We got free lunches every day. What about the other tribal chiefs that came and sat in their front row? They all got blankets, very elaborate blankets. And then there were enactments, enactments of the various cultural myths that held that tribe together. Okay, well, rituals are prescribed as step-by-step -step performance of mythic tales. Well, as I said before, right is just one prescription. Ceremonies are many. Rituals come right in the middle. There are so many examples of rituals. I know that some of you are from Mexico, and I was able to participate in a peyote ceremony. No, pardon me, a mush, a mushroom ceremony with the student of Maria Sabina in Huata de Jimenez. And so this was, of course, a very elaborate ritual, and it proceeded very well over the course of the night. And then the, the uh, Huichols, also from Mexico, the far western part of Mexico in the mountains, and they have a number of uh, Narikas, this is their ceremonial use of the sacred mushroom, sacred, pardon me, the sacred peyote. And then there are the Ayahuasca visionarios from the uh, Amazon, mainly in Brazil and Peru, where Ayahuasca has been used ritually for, for centuries. And then we have the Northwest Indian potlatches, which I just mentioned. Grateful Dead concerts can be seen as somewhat of a ritual. Of course, serving shamanic functions. Okay, I define myths already, and myths drive rituals, and they act and reinforce myths. So you can see how so much of this uh, ties together with one pattern reinforcing another one. Now, an example of shamans is scientists, is their manufacture of the complex mind-altering view ayahuasca, which goes by many other names, depending on the part of the Amazon where it is used. Jeremy Narby commented, here are people without electron microscopes who chose among 80,000 Amazonian plant species the leaves of a bush containing a brain hormone, which they combine with the vine containing substances that activate an enzyme of the digestive tract, which would otherwise block the effect, as if they knew about the molecular properties of plants and the arts of combining them. Well, when I talk with people in these tribes and say, how did you learn this? They, oh, the plants told us. So <laughs> that's the best explanation that I can come up with myself. Yes, it's quite remarkable that the Amazonian Indians were able to concoct the ayahuasca brew with this very advanced pharmaceutical knowledge. The medicines used by Native American shamans were often more effective than those used by the European invaders. Stein estimated that 60% of the medicinal plants used by the Rappahannock tribe had unquestioned medicinal value. The European medicines were far less useful. In a 1960 survey, the U.S. National Archives of Science reviewed the effectiveness of all medicines marketed since 1938, finding evidence for their effectiveness for just 40%, and only half of this number justified the claims of their manufacturers.
this is very important aspect of shamanism because outsiders often say, well, of course, the medicines that the shamans use cure a lot of people, but that's because of the placebo effect. Well, of course, much of it is the placebo effect, but there's also these findings now indicating that the shamanic medicines had and probably still have unquestioned medicinal use and value. Very, very important part of our knowledge of shamanism. The placebo effect is unique human adaptation. Daniel Dennett has described how it may have served adaptive purposes in human evolution. Because shamanic rituals and treatments made use of suggested imagination, early humans who responded survived. Those who did not respond did not survive, and their genes dropped out of the dream pool. Brain scanning technology has identified the dorsal horn of the spinal cord as the most likely location for placebo activity. This region processes sensory signals of the earliest stage of their input and could be a potential site for new treatments for pain and other ailments that are alleviated by placebo effect. Also, there you have it. The placebo effect is being studied and uh, origins are being identified. And people who are highly suggestible were able to better put to use these suggestions and even the medicines that shamans gave to them. So this is how placebo effects played such an important role in human evolution. According to Nicholas Humphrey's economic resource management hypothesis, the body conserves its resources, but spends them when survival is at stake. Combating infection by fever, repelling toxins by vomiting, halting dangerous activities with pain signals. The placebo effect, according to this hypothesis, is a releasing trigger that tells the body to spare no expense in using available resources because there is hope for a cure. As a result, hope, faith, and expectation often make the differences between life and death. Shamans knew how to utilize each of these factors, thus play an important role in human evolution. Okay, so here is another important aspect of the role that shamans played over the millennia in keeping the human species together and enabling the whole evolutionary process to move forward. Some of the shamans I've met over the years Wallace Black Elk was the great grandnephew of the famous Black Elk of Black Elk Speaks. And Wallace Black Elk carried on the very active shamanic practice of his own during most of his adult life, working with people and also conducting workshops for people who wanted to know more about shamanism. I might just add, anybody who wants to study how to be a shamanic practitioner, there are several venues that I think are responsible. First of all is the Michael Harner training practices that the anthropologist Michael Harner developed when he was alive, and his Society for Shamanic Studies still offers these workshops and their basic training and what he called core shamanism. There's also the Society for Shamanic Practitioners. And this is a group of people from various disciplines who are using shamanism in their practice. You can check their website out because they also have excellent training programs for people who want to have these skills. And of course, this is my old friend Rolling Thunder, who I knew and worked with for several decades. And he and his grandson, Sidian Morningstar, and I have put together 
two books in honor of Rolling Thunder, and I can talk for hours about our interactions. I'll just give you one example, because we talked about how shamans interact with other forms of life. At one point, I was visiting Rolling Thunder in his spiritual community in Nevada, and it was in the evening, and he took me to the very, very edge of his property, where his property becomes a state-protected forest. And then he cupped his hands and he started to yelp. Well, I had seen Rolling Thunder do so many strange things in my life. I was not put off by that. But he was yelping. And then a whole pack of coyote came out of the woods. And the leader of the pack started to yelp back. And the two of them carried on this dialogue of yelping back and forth. And then the coyotes retreated back into the woods. And I said, Archie, what was that all about? He, well, I renewed our contract. Our community will not hunt them down and kill them. And in return, they will not raid our chicken coops and eat our chickens. And it has worked. We have not lost a single chicken to coyotes. So that's sort of a little vignette of shamanic interaction of other forms of life. And of course, this is the famous Maria Sabina. And I was very fortunate to get to visit her when she was alive in Huaca de Jimenez. And she said that she was too old to lead us on a uh, mushroom velada, but one of her students served that function. It was a very, very memorable event. Well, Maria Sabina, for those of you who don't know about her, is very famous because once the Spaniards conquered Mexico, the Catholic Church did away with all of the old rituals, including the use of mushrooms and peyote. However, in this part of the state of Oaxaca, the ceremonies did proceed underground for centuries so that the priests would not know what they were doing. And it gave the people in the community a great sense of uh, meaning and hope. So in Maria Sabina's case, she has a long life history, which I really don't have time to go into, but she made friends with the local priest. And so she was allowed to do the veladas without fear of retribution. So a Boston banker, Gordon Wasson, was also an aficionado of mushrooms. Uh, and he heard that the mushroom ceremony was still going on in Oaxaca, and so he made an expedition. Coincidentally, Maria Sabina had just had a dream in which Jesus Christ came to her and said, the world really needs your knowledge now. And then when Gordon Wasson came, the people in the community said, no, we don't use mushrooms. We're good Catholics. We wouldn't think of having mushrooms. But then Maria Sabina stepped out of the crowd and said, no, Jesus Christ has told me that I can share the secret of the mushrooms with you. So for better or for worse, that is how the mushrooms were discovered and how eventually they became uh, psilocybin, used now in various mental health concerns. And so Maria Sabina, indeed, was a very, very historic person. Much more to the story uh, 
which I don't have time to go into. But I was very, very fortunate to have our visit and take those wonderful photographs when she was still alive. Credo Muta, uh, another famous shaman in South Africa, a uh, member of the Zulu tribe, and one of the traditions at the beginning of the decade is to throw the bones, to have a shaman throw the bones. This is a little ritual that is used in working with clients. The two of them will take these sacred bones, breathe into the bones, throw them on the floor, and then the way that they emerge indicates the direction that the healing must take. Well, Credo Mutual was going into his own shamanic state with all of the drumming going on, and so he came up with the prediction uh, that Nelson Mandela would become Prime Minister of South Africa. Not just wishful thinking, I thought he's just barely out of jail and he's lucky to be alive. Of course, I was wrong. And within a few years, uh, Nelson Mandela was the Prime Minister of South Africa. So that one of his predictions that came true that I was actually a witness for. Trader Muto was quite remarkable. He was an accomplished artist, mythologist, storyteller, and writer. And his books are excellent testimonies on what it takes to become a shaman in his particular tribe. And the various training that one has to go through. When I was witnessing his drumming for the turn of the decade, a group of soldiers came in and they took Kredo Mutwa and they said, we just want to ask him a few questions. He's not in any danger. Well, much later he came back and his black face was almost white with fear and he shared with us what the soldiers want to do is for me to persuade families to give them information and then they will tell the family where their dead son, father, whatever, who is killed, is buried because they believe that the soul cannot transcend the body until there's a proper burial. So, of course, Trey the Muta was not going to do that, so he just stepped over the border into another country, and then he reemerged when apartheid was over. Okay, well, I think that gives you an overview of shamanism, and how dreams are so essential in many of the shamanic societies. And, you know, learning to be a dream worker in some ways is similar to becoming a shamanic practitioner of some sort or another. Here is a highly specialized skill. And you can use it to help others in terms of ethical practices and in terms of modesty and humility, which I'm certainly faced with. The world of dreams is so expansive and so comprehensive and so multifaceted that I have to be modest in terms of knowing that the little piece of that knowledge that I possess is far from the whole thing. 
Okay, thank you all for being with us and good luck in all of your endeavors. Beautiful. Thank you, Stan. Okay, you are more than welcome. Goodbye, everybody.